The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Charney and this is the Leon Charney Report and we thought that we would bring you a bunch of scholars today to tell us how to digest what is going on in the Middle East. It seems that uh, there's a lot of controversy within Israel, without Israel, all over the world. Uh, this peace process maybe is moving, maybe is not moving. We're going to find out from the scholars. They usually evaluate and uh, they really can't tell you how to do it. That's why we thought you, we'd bring them on and have some fun with them. Eleven Jewish people have been killed so far, Israelis have been killed since the signing of the uh, uh, Declaration of, uh, of Memorandum of Understanding between Arafat and Rabin, and Jewish settlers have become very vehement in their uh, feelings against the uh, Arab population. Very afraid, by the way, that the new police of the uh, West Bank and Jericho, who are, who are former terrorists, will really uh, threaten the society of Israel. I understand that one very big Jewish settler was arrested this evening by the police, and uh, it looks nearly like a bit of a civil war. Look, we're going to check it. We have a lot of scholars tonight, and the first scholar is Professor Amnon Cohen from Hebrew University, a scholar and a uh, professor of Middle East Studies. Professor, before we get to, by the way, you're also head of the James Sasser Institute, which we'll talk about later, but before we get to that, your... Uh, appraisal so far of what is happening with this peace process. Are we moving forward, backwards? Well, since you spoke so highly of university professors, let me uh, return the compliment and use television language. We definitely are rolling. That's the most important thing over there. That is, a process has started and it cannot be rolled back, unlike perhaps certain television shows. And that's the most important part Why of it. Why can't a process be rolled back? Oh, well, theoretically everything is possible, but Whenever, when both have a parties, scientist on, I'll bet you he'll prove it, by the way. Well, you ask him later on in, on his show. Let me be, be in charge of my own. Um, the minute both participants are willing, both bride side and the bridegroom side, that is, both the Israelis, the government, that is, most of public opinion, that's all that counts. And as long but, as the, but, but, Professor, the yeah. latest public opinion that shows that there has been a certain Rab no, erosion. No, not certain. Rabin does not carry the majority of the, gov of the people right now. He's below well, the 50 percent. Leon, line. I don't have to tell you about democracy. That's why elections are being carried out in democracy not every evening, but rather once every four years. And in between, the, whoever is in charge of government is entitled, has full authority to run the show whatever he, he, way he chooses. And usually, quite a number of them at least, I don't know, want to speculate, uh, manage to get re-elected in your country and elsewhere. So it's too early. You can't judge by the, the the, the oscillation of public opinion poll. It's true that the recent events in Israel, very sad events, uh, very disturbing events for me as an Israeli, definitely not just as a Near Eastern Studies scholar, uh, definitely are worrying. Okay, so things have to be done, action has to be taken, steps uh, have, ha have to be, have to be um, um, also taken. But the most important thing is not so much a vision but rather keep the main course. And the main course, both as far as Israelis are concerned and as Arab Palestinians, many of them, most of them are concerned. Let's hope so. I can more easily speak of my people, even though I think I'm slightly um, acquainted with what's going on in the other part of the fence, so to speak, um, are willing to go ahead. And that's the most important thing. Of course, in the transitory stage that we are finding ourselves at right now, uh, we are bound to go. We, we always knew, and we find out to our. Uh, it's very, it's very uh, disturbing to find it out to our regret that there are quite a number of elements that try to uh, rock the boat, try to stop the process, try to undo whatever has been done. But as I said before, the, the film is rolling, and unlike television shows, we don't know the, the timing when it's going to end. But definitely the direction is very clear. The course has been charted. And I think that with certain element of certainty, if a historian may venture 
referring to, to or speculating to, uh, as far as the future goes. Uh, with certain element of certainty, one can say that we definitely are making progress. Now, the main thing is, of course, not let yourself get distracted, sidetracked by all sides of things, both done by Arabs and those which are done wrongly, to my uh, best, of, best of my understanding, by, by Jewish settlers. I mean, it's not that we are right or they are wrong, they are right or we are wrong. I mean, the most important thing is, is to, uh, to avoid any uh, secondary, tertiary elements. Well, how do you do uh, that? Well, by enforcing law and order to start with, you just mentioned something that I didn't know about an arrest of someone. He was probably arrested. I don't know who the guy is and what his charge is, but a person is usually being arrested in our part of the world, and I guess all over the world, in most parts of the world at least, because there are certain, uh, certain charges against it. He has of offended the law one way or another. So this is one way. That is keep the law strictly as strictly as can be and apply to both friend and foe. As, and don't go ahead and, 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 and have an, another, a, a daily Gallup poll as to whether the Palestinians like it, whether the Israelis like it, whether the uh, settlers like it, whether the university professors like it, or whether television interviewers like it. I mean, there is a, a government policy. It has to be carried out. Now, I said enforce law and order. This is one important thing. Look for compromise. This is something which is actually being done right now in, in Egypt, in Cairo. That is, there are two delegations, an Israeli and a Palestinian delegation. Each and every one of the two is 100%. They know the final and best possible answer to how the thing should be resolved. But since the, the two are not necessarily seeing eye to eye, they are bound to find a compromise. And as we are told, and this is also a piece uh, that is being reported in the news these last couple of days, there has been quite a, an, an amount of progress achieved. I'm sure you know that. So try and achieve progress along the, along the course of compromise, which means that you will never, I or you, whoever, will never get 100% of what they wish and think they are entitled to, but get to a reasonable, not just a start, a, a reasonable cause that they can carry on on. Do you believe that there will ultimately be a Palestinian state? Well, I believe that there's, that, well, ultimately, someday, sometime, there'll be a in certain, uh, there's, there'll be definitely in the, in certain, uh, sometime in the future, let's put it this way, there'll be a certain Palestinian political entity, whether it's going to be a state, whether it's going to be an independent one, whether it's going to be part of Jordan or in confederation with Jordan or any other configuration is hard to speculate. You know that the Middle East is very unstable, very difficult to, to, to analyze of, of present day situation and how about speculate about the future. But I think that the way we see things evolve, definitely Palestinians are going to have an increasing role in running their own affairs by themselves. Whether it's going to be exactly a state, independent, how big, how small, depends to a very large extent, mind you, on the way they're going to behave. Because let's bear in mind, you, you, um, a little bit, you were a little bit hesitant before whether you should refer to it as a declaration of principle or, 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 or a memorandum signed. Well, it's a declaration of principle that had been decided upon and signed. It's principles. The question is how they're going to carry it out. If the Palestinians definitely deliver, as we expect them to deliver, as we're going to deliver, we're going to deliver hand back territory first, right? And, and authorities and so on. If Palestinians are going to deliver, that is enforce law and order, take the things beating Gaza, which is more important, the Gaza Strip and or, or Jericho, into their own hands. And be it a former terrorist or, or not so former terrorist, we, we've quite not that much time ago have been hearing this argument apropos the late Prime Minister Begin had been a president, a, a terrorist then became a prime minister and so on. You know history is very <coughs> volatile, sorry. The most important thing is that these guys can enforce law and order, which will eventually show and indicate at least that they are able to run their own affairs by themselves. If not, then it's, it may well stay for quite a while only as a declaration of principles, not more than that. All right, we're a capitalist show, so we've got to cut for a commercial break. And we'll be back in one minute to continue our conversation with Professor Amnon Cohen, who's giving us an illumination, an elucidation, an appraisal by a professor of uh, the DOP. They call it Declaration of Principles. We'll be back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. 
Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We're back. It's all professors' days on all professors' day on the Leon Charney report. We've got all professors today, and we're all going to talk about the peace process. We're going to talk about science. We're going to talk about uh, some secret professor who is uh, probably one of the boys that started this thing with Arafat. I got a surprise for him when I tell him who really started, but we won't give that away till later. We're talking now with Professor Amlin Cohn, who's a brilliant scholar in Middle East studies at Hebrew University and heads up an institute called the James Sasha Institute. What is that institute, Professor? Well, it's an institute which has recently uh, been started, the Hebrew U, which conducts seminars uh, for outside students, kind of, that is actually trying to follow very much um, the um, general structure and approach of the Aspen Institute, which you may well be familiar with mm. in Colorado. Right. That is an institute which offers seminars to the non-professional people, or uh, rather to high-powered people in not in their specific field. That is the political scientist meeting with the political scientist. Oh, I could study biology there because I'm a, a if, lawyer. If you definitely come and join one of the biology uh, seminars, fine. So far, we, this is genetic engineering, which is definitely very high on our list of priorities, hasn't started yet. What we've done so far are two, uh, one kind of seminar and another one which is upcoming. The one which we did already ties up very much with the first part of, of uh, our interview. That is, we had three years, each year, an annual seminar on ver various aspects of the Middle East one on the Middle East in the post-Cold War period, then one on the nationalism in the Middle East, and the third one which was, we just uh, wound up on the changing map of Europe and the Middle East. Uh, in these seminars, since this is not aimed at experts, that the political scientists to come by, or historians, but rather a wider uh, audience, we had all kinds of people. We had people coming from Europe, say the governor, lady governor of the Central Bank of Austria, we had Chinese uh, professor of, of Chinese history, and we had lots of people from the United States, like lawyers, community leaders, um, um, business people. All right, how does one so get on. involved? How does one get to this institute? Well, it's by invitation only. Uh, people who behave themselves properly get invited, mark my words. And uh, My seriously, director is Polish and very anxious to go to Israel. Can he get invited? Well, let him behave himself properly. He and uh, He's giving no. you a good view. He's, uh, you see how beautiful you look. Well, the mo most important thing is how I sound rather than the way I look. Uh, and the most in important thing is definitely, we, we uh, in order to get people invited, we approach them, of course. We hear about them, as we just heard about your producer or just learned about yourself. And then we make our own uh, decisions and approach people and invite them. The interesting thing is not only Middle Eastern seminars as we had uh, last year and this year with his Hak Rabin, his keynote and other top Israeli um, uh, officials and university professors, but rather the upcoming seminar will be a totally new element. The one which is scheduled immediately after Passover, after Pesach, after Easter, the first week of coming April, will be on Jewish history, or uh, rather on our roots. That is, it's true that Israel is a state not only of Jews, but it's mainly and predominantly the land of the Jewish people, of course. And we're going to run a seminar on center and periphery in Jewish history and culture, starting from biblical time, going all the way through history, that is, Second Temple and uh, Europe, Eastern Europe and the Muslim world, 
an upsurge and an, an, an emergence of Zionism, and of course ending up with a very long day which will be focusing on this highly important question of the relationship between Israel and the diaspora nowadays. That is Jerusalem vis-a-vis -vis New York, if you wish, or New York vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem. By the way, I understand you're an expert on Turkey. I just we're only student of his, I, I, students of history, uh, not all, experts you, on anything. You're all products of the Ottoman Empire, right? That is correct. And I was in Turkey about two weeks ago with the delegation that went to Israel, and I find it a fascinating country. I find it has 60 million Muslims who are, in a sense, pro-Israel today. And, well, the country's well, policy, quite a number you, of them. you have embassies now. Oh, embassies, definitely. We've had embassies for quite a while. And, yeah. uh, your borders are fascinating to their borders are very fascinating sure. so we don't have too much time I think first of all I want to know how someone enrolls in the Sasha Institute and then I want your opinion about Turkey it's very important okay in order to enroll at uh, the Sasha, uh, Sasha Institute you just write to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Jerusalem care of the Sasha Institute or uh, call you and you will redirect the uh, the invitations to us uh, we are uh, PO box 4157 Jerusalem Israel. Um, uh, the um, most important thing is, um, of course, to get interested in it. And then uh, sooner or later, because there is a waiting list, uh, sooner or later one may get uh, involved with the Shasha Institute, and we, uh, we definitely would welcome um, a variety of people. And seriously, I invite you, Leon, to come by too. Now, as for Turkey, it's much, of course, uh, of greater importance than the few seconds that we have uh, to allocate <laughs> to it. Uh, and not only judged by the fact that it's 60 million mostly Muslims, of course, and not only judged by the fact uh, that it's quite um, uh, friendly to Israel, but because of the fact that these are, these are two countries totally dissimilar in, in size, in religion, and even in history to a very large extent. They regard themselves as, as um, Hittites, and we are Semites, and so on and so forth. But this is a predominantly Muslim, the largest Muslim state in the world with which Israel has meaningful diplomatic relations. And not, not just diplomatic relations, but commercial, lots of growing, you just mentioned, lots of growing commercial ties, lots of opportunities for both economies, both Turkey and Israel. We don't have our NAFTA yet in the Middle East, but had there been any similar to the your NAFTA, it would have passed by perhaps a much larger margin than here and with less involvement of our government or the Turkish government because there is definitely mutual interest of both parties, both Israelis and Turks. So are you hopeful that there will uh, be a very gainful relationship between the two countries? Well, unfortunately, I'm not a business person, so I, don't, I can't make anything out of it. But as a historian, as a political scientist, no, definitely, I think, seriously, I think that there is a great chance for both economies to prosper as a result of this growing or ongoing relationship between the two countries. And it definitely has some political, some political right, dimensions. We're going to cut for a commercial break, and then we're going to bring on Professor Joseph Bodenheimer, who is president of Jerusalem College of Technology, who has a bit of a different point of view and Professor Cohen about the peace process, and it's going to be an interesting time, so stay with us. It's nearly as good as the Jackie Mason show versus Charney. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com.
Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We're back. I'm Leon Charney. Continue our day with scholars. Uh, we have welcomed another scholar, Professor Joseph Bodenheimer, who is the president of Jerusalem College of Technology. He's got his PhD in electro-optics, which is a very interesting field. I wish I knew what it meant, but he'll explain it to you. And we're going to continue with Professor Amlin Cohen, because they have a diverse opinion, both very, very bright men, intellectual, and they are not politicians, so it's very interesting to listen to them. Professor Bodenheimer, Tell us a little bit about the Jerusalem College of Technology. It's not that well known in America yet. Jerusalem College of Technology was founded 25 years ago, popularly known as Machon Lev in Israel, here JCT. Uh, we specialize in three fields of technology and another field which is close to technology. Uh, the fields we have are electronics, electro-optics, and computers. And in addition, we give also a degree in managerial accounting. It is an institution of higher education, uh, recognized by the Council of Higher Education of the State of Israel. And we have turned out already more than 1,000 graduates who are occupying uh, positions as engineers and managers, in, mostly in Israel's high-tech industry. You do a lot of research there, don't you? Yes, we do. We have, in fact, a lot of cooperation with Israeli industry and with various research foundations in Israel and abroad. Most of your students have an orthodox Jewish leaning? Yes, the Jerusalem College of Technology offers a program of Jewish studies in the morning and then in the afternoon, uh, academic, te <coughs> excuse me, academic technological studies. I asked you this yesterday, why does a professor like you become a president of a college when it's uh, practically the purpose of a president is to raise money, right, Abnon? Correct. In most causes. And you're a skilled man. You've done some great, uh, uh, you've discovered two great things. You told me yesterday, something with a road. Uh -huh. I've developed discoveries? a roadside monitor known as the Marom, which right. is now used in Israel and is marketed worldwide in order to combat the terrible carnage of road accidents. And a president of Eastman Kodak called me up this morning. He was crying that you didn't accept a job with him because you didn't want to leave Israel, you told him. Is that true? Yes, I was uh, made a very generous offer by Eastman Kodak some time ago when I was working there. I was on sabbatical. I was the first Israeli to be granted a sabbatical at Eastman Kodak. And I think they rather liked the work that I did for them. And they were prepared to give me a very generous offer to stay on. I told them that I feel that the place of a Jewish person is in the state of Israel. We go to play a commercial now, come to Israel, join friends, right? <laughs> and we cut right away. Uh, seriously, though, it's always interesting to me, and I, I spoke with you about this yesterday, why a man who has such great inclinations towards R&D would take a job as the president of a college? And your answer was pretty interesting. That's why I want you to tell it to the audience. Well, I would say that the reason I am at the Jerusalem College of Technology is because I believe in uh, the idealistic mission of the college. And I believe that there's a job to be done there. And that job means preparing engineers for Israel's high-tech uh, high tech industry, engineers who are well-versed in the Jewish tradition and therefore identify very strongly with the state of Israel. Kosher engineers. You might say that. Uh, therefore, I think that if there's a job to be done, and if uh, it is thought that I'm the man to do the job, I have to take it upon myself, even though it means leaving behind temporarily maybe, my extensive interest in R&D. Well said. All right, you heard Professor Amlin Cohen, who's a tremendous professor in Middle East history. You've heard of Jerusalem Hebrew University, right? You've heard of Professor Cohen. He's a well-known professor in his field. You heard what he said about the uh, peace process. What are your feelings? Well, I think you enlightened it, Leon, to a, a process rolling along and I'm a little afraid that that is what is happening. We are talking here about a process under conditions of extreme uncertainty. In science, when you're working on a process with uncertainty involved, you have controls, you watch the process, you see how it's progressing. And I think you made a very important point when you said 
We have to be able to go back at every point if we see that things are not progressing the way we expected them to do so that we have a controlled process. To me, it seems at this point in time, and I think it's looking more and more that way to more and more citizens of Israel, that this is a process out of control and is steamrolling along in a way which could be, I hope it will not be, dangerous to the existence of the state. Amon, would you agree? Well, um, I would beg to differ with one or two minor things. First of all, the points that were just rightly mentioned <coughs> by Professor Bodenheimer were points that I raised rather than you about the controls and so on. Sorry, right. I have no copyright. Uh, uh, the, the, we're not going to charge royalties, but the reason for making this point is because uh, on this we definitely agree. Now, what, what's left is the only point of divergence, uh, if my understanding is correct, is that uh, my colleague thinks that it, the process ran out of control altogether right now, and I would wish to um, uh, hear from him what he has in mind, because All I right, don't see any reason him. for that. No, I didn't say it's actually out of control. I think what we, we talked about before, I think what he meant concerning me was that a process can be reversed. I think that's correct. what he was talking about. And I said any process can be reversed, and you said it's irreversible. So i got to get my copy oh. right in. All right? Am I right, Professor? Fine. Absolutely. I am scared of irreversible processes. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, well let's, let, let me um, do justice to my argument first, because uh, I don't want anyone to think that I, I um, backtrack on, on things that I said or didn't say. Well, the process, I would hope, very much is irreversible, definitely, on this. We, if this, uh, uh, this is my point, and we may definitely disagree on it. Um, I hope that it's irreversible by way of, by way of saying that um, uh, this is headed towards an understanding, or it starts off from a certain element of the Declaration of Principle, agreement on certain principles, and it headed, it's headed towards compromise, understanding, and reasonable conditions of life between two peoples who happen to inhabit the same tract of land. If this is irreversibility, yes, we are irreversible in, on this. Where we are reverse, when the, where the process, where the process sorry, is reversible, is exactly the point that you rightly uh, termed as controls, and which I refer to as, as, as we have to look at the way they behave in order to see where it takes us, how far we're going to progress. Now, there, the question of timing and of, of stages and a uh, timetable, and, and width and length and so on and so forth is definitely under our control. See what's happening right now in Egypt. After all, uh, it definitely no, no agreement or no understanding will, understanding will be reached without Israeli and or Palestinian, of course. All right, we got a cut for commercial break. I'm going to ask you one question, Professor. Were you mm -hmm. for the Camp David agreements? Yes. All right, we'll come back right after a commercial break. This is a very interesting conversation. Don't leave us. We have two professors here, uh, equally brilliant, different ideas, and non-political. So you're going to really get some terrific thrashing <laughs> out of a, a very hot topic today. Will the peace process, or whatever it is, between uh, the Palestinian Liberty Organization and Israel continue? Is it irreversible? Will it have a a conclusion that is welcome to, to the world and to the Jews and to the Arabs. Stay tuned. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed, Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. 
Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We're back. I'm Leon Charney, and this is All Scholars Day with professors from Israel who uh, take different points of view on what is happening with the peace process. As I said before, both brilliant men, Amnon Cohen, professor of Middle East history at the Hebrew University, and Professor Yosef Bodenheimer, who is the president of Jerusalem College of Technology, and uh, he has his PhD in electro-optics. I'm going to find out what that is, but I'm too busy right now because I have to find out what's going on in the peace process. Uh, Yosef, uh, I'm going to make some good points. I mean, both people make a claim on the land, so basically if you're Solomon, you, you somehow come up with a division and try to divide it. If you don't go forward with this peace plan, how do you uh, finally solve, or s how, do you, how do you bring a solution to this terrible problem? Well, I think uh, everybody uh, is cool. looking for peace. Peace is a great thing, and you the nation... You think Eric Sharon wants peace? I'm sure he does. You are? I mean, I haven't asked him personally. Okay. I'm, I, I'm not a political person. Are you sure Eric Sharon wants peace? The only question is at what price? What right. kind of? The only question is not so much the term, not just the slogan, the slogan but what's in the underneath. I mean, in this matter, we agree. You don't think, by the way, uh, there are some diabolical people, I'm talking about Sharon, who, who really don't want peace at times? Uh, there's, a, there's a psychological factor in that? Well, of course, warmongers, uh, yeah. arms dealers, and so on. But you we're always speaking, have a fringe element yeah, no, like speaking, that. We're speaking in terms of... Um, all right, by the way, I'm nations. clear it's not Sharon I'm talking about. I'm just curious about there are some people who can't There are always some people who can do Okay, you always have so a you, element let's continue. You, you think everybody wants peace. So now we're talking about the price. Right. And uh, the question is, has the Israeli public been prepared and given enough time to digest this peace process? Or I would say to that question, no. I would say that they have not been given enough time. And I, I would, would say, agree. and I would agree, and you would agree on that. I, I would say this was a coup by Shimon Peres to entrap Yitzhak Rabin. You could see by the pictures the way he was uh, <laughs> floating around on a lawn. I was on a White House lawn. I saw yeah, Rabin. He, he looked like a tap dancer but in Harlem. Uh, believe me, he was looking for a cigarette. He was, he was <laughs> you're probably he right. Supposed to smoke. Though. That's that was all. And I think it was an entrapment. I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm just saying it was an entrapment by Shimon Peres because it happened so fast and so suddenly. The Rabin woke up one morning and says, okay, i got to sign a peace treaty, otherwise I lose the government. I'm trapped. So he went forward. Doesn't mean it's bad, by the way. Sometimes good no. things happen in a spontaneous way. Something, sometimes you have to be trapped. That's the political process. But I do agree with you. In my opinion, when we worked on Camp David, the concept was that you must gear a nation or give a nation at least two years to digest some feelings about it. I mean, one day your sworn enemy is Mr. Arafat. The next day you're on a lawn though reluctantly doing it, he's shaking his hand. It's a pretty hard thing for most Israelis to swallow. Even Amnon had a problem with that, I would bet. And it's not so yeah, easy. Well, Amnon isn't such a dove, and he's done accomplished certain things in his life which will not necessarily make him very kosher in some eyes, in not I necessarily Jewish background. eyes. I know, I know But the question is not so much that of Arafat or of Rabin. That's why you're not interviewing Arafat or Rabin, among other reasons. I do. The question, or right now here, I mean. I got the scholars. What do I need Because them the question is exactly, you just pointed at the right angle. You would like to know what the reaction is among people, the common scholars. Life, okay? Scholars as human beings, believe it or scholars not. Scholars influence some of them people. Are. Right. Period. Now there you have a divergence of opinions among uh, opinion among scholars. Yeah. I would and the question is it boils down to my mind. We'll have uh, in a minute an, uh, another angle perhaps. Boils down to the question where do you look? Do you look backwards or do you look forwards? Because there's looking backwards there's enough reason that we should have been prepared for years educated, put in as much money as can be, wait until Messiah comes and so on, and then there wouldn't have been bad, we would have had enough time, but there wouldn't have been anyone who could uh, possibly enjoy it and, and benefit by it. Uh, and the, uh, on the other hand, because, because of, the, of the fact that past memories and experience mean bloodshed, hatred, and so on. The other way, and this dictates, of course, that we should be fearful and we shouldn't trust and so on and so forth. And to a very large extent, rightly so. The other approach is, no, let's look towards the future without forgetting the past. After all, our, our feet are still on the ground. But 
look into the future and say, hey, let's try another chance. Let's try another option. True, there are certain risks we're taking. So what? Okay. Crossing the road is also taking I get your risk. point. Your point. Yeah. How do you stop the killing? How do you make peace? How do you arrive at a solution with the Palestinians? They are, after all, a fixture in the Middle East today. He will tell you that from Middle East history. They are a fixture. How, how would you solve the problem? I think one has to feel one's way along and, as I mentioned, control the situation as much as one can. One makes a step forward. If that step proves to be good, then one makes, makes another step forward towards the peace process. However, if it turns out that things are not moving forward the way we would like, we cannot be entrapped in a strict process where you are limited by certain dates and you have to deliver by a certain date and then you have to move forward and forward and forward but under pressure But how would you move anything behind. unless you put dates on it? I will explain. I think that the key to the whole peace process are the Jewish settlements in the area of Yehuda and Shomron. Judea and Samaria. We Judea have some people in Somalia watch us. Okay. <laughs> Samaria, you say? Somalia. I think they were the key. I think they were the key before this process started because I do not think that the Palestinians would have been prepared to enter negotiations with the Israeli side, if not that they were afraid that the Jewish settlers were going to increase in numbers in Judah and Samaria. I also think that they will continue to be the crux of the situation because I think that the real test of whether the Palestinians mean peace for real is going to be their attitude to the Jewish settlers in those states. We have had Arab settlements in the state of Israel ever since 1948. Those people have not been harmed, they live in peace, they have equal rights to the Jewish people in the state of Israel. We have let them live in peace, their own way of life. I Joseph, would like can I ask you a question? Conceptually, do you have any problem with a Palestinian state if it's a peaceful state? Yes, I have a problem with the Palestinian state. I'm not the you conceptually. Not. I you don't have any conceptual problem because I, I'm not here to, to dictate neither to the Somalis, nor to the Samarians, nor to anyone else the way they want to live. First of all, I had a point when he said, I disagreed prop with most of the things he said, of course, but he had a point when he said one of the lacmus papers would be the way, what kind of relationship, relationship is going to evolve between Palestinians and, and, and settlers. Right. Only from a totally different perspective, I, I say right. That is, if there be a Palestinian state, if there be a Palestinian entity, if there be a confederated something, whatever, a certain, certain entity, not a state, those settlers who feel so strongly about living in Hebron, in or around uh, Nablus, and so on and so forth, if they feel so strongly about it, let them go on feeling like this. Let them go on living like this. There is no reason, speaking of history, let's not just turn back to the history which is true, which was just quoted of ever since 48, but let's say several hundreds or thousands of years, there have been Jewish people living under Muslim rule all throughout the history, sometimes in better circumstances, sometimes in, in worse conditions, but on the whole, those who feel very... Let's take just one example, okay? Hebron. It's a sacred city to Jews, it's a sacred city to Arabs. Now, one way would say, okay, since it's our sacred city, to hell with the Arabs. This is no way to go about politics, of course. The other one would be, let's suppose for the sake of this discussion that Hebron is going to become tomorrow part of this entity, be it Palestinian, Jordanian, whatever. Those Jews who feel so strongly about leaving them, let them live there. Israel will have to take care of the vital interests, that is to, 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 to negotiate the future with the authorities there, but if they wish to live there, if you ask me what's going to happen, let me venture uh, just a proposition. The number is going and is already starting to dwindle, or at least they're not All as right, sure we as they were. we got for a commercial break, and I'm going to get Joseph's response to that. Don't leave us. This is a hot debate. Crossfire, Pap Buchanan, Kinsley have nothing compared to us. Stay tuned. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. 
Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We're back. We're having a very lively and uh, important discussion with the two very important professors, Professor Amnon Cohen of Hebrew University, who is also uh, the executive director in charge of the James Shasha Institute, which we spoke about before, which gets high-powered characters like myself to go to Jerusalem and to study things they never studied before, like electro-optics or something like that. We have uh, Joseph Bodenheimer who's president of the Jerusalem College of Technology, and in case you haven't heard about it, you know about it now, and it's evidently a great place which uh, coaches a lot of electricians, I mean a lot of engineers, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what we're talking about now. We're talking about a very serious topic, we're talking about the peace process. We're talking about how two uh, very important gentlemen differ as to what they think is going on now. One thinks we have an irreversible process. The other one says, let's stop, check, go slowly. Let's use a scientific approach. You're entitled to a retort to what he said before. Yes, I uh, would like to carry on on the theme that I started before, and that is that I think that just as in the past, the Jewish settlers in Judea and Samaria were very important for the preparedness of the Palestinians to speak about peace, I think that the continuation is going to depend very much on their attitude to the Jewish settlers. So far, we've seen very bad things. 11 or 12 settlers have been murdered since this peace process started. That is not a good sign. Arafat has only apologized for one inc incident. I do not think that that's good enough. I do not think that that is a serious enough response to uh, what I the Israeli public is beginning to think is a battle of the Palestinians against the Jewish settlements in Judah and Samaria. Just the same way as Arabs can live in peace in Israel, so Jewish settlers have to be allowed to live in peace in Judea and Samaria. All right, if you, Rabin, called you tonight and said, uh, Professor, give me some advice how I should handle this matter, what would you tell him? Let me ask you the same question, Amman. What would you tell him? I would say that whenever an attack on Jewish settlers occurs, that should be cause for reevaluation of the status of the process at that point in time. The Palestinians should realize every time such a thing happens, their progress, what they stand to gain, is under risk. Amnon? Yes, of course. Well, let me uh, ask you a question sure. before you answer. Uh, he's right about one point. Arafat fetched out some kind of apology or condemnation, sure. Sure. Uh, and Clinton had to call him, and uh, Abu Masa had to call him, and Mubarak had to call him, and I think Nasser woke up from the... Everybody had to call him, and he finally gave some kind of, uh, I don't know, retort to what happened. So wh what do you feel about that? Listen, what I feel about that is, once again, let's, again, let's not shift the focus of our discussion. Because had Arafat says twice as much, has given three denial denials and four apologies, would you have been content with it? This is I'd the like question. to respond to that. No, yes. I would like to finish okay. up my question. My You'll answer, get a chance. I mean, the question is not whether I'm happy with what Arafat said. Of course, I could have dictated or suggested that he make, he make it better, and perhaps next time or, or he will be pressed or we'll have to do that. The main thing, and there it's right, of course, how do we move forward 
Not so much how do we elicit this or that declaration out of this or that uh, Palestinian. This is one point. Number two, let's stop referring to Palestinians as a, as a gray, un, un, uh, unclear uh, entity. I mean, Arafat is a big Palestinian, impressive or depressing, but he is in charge, we hope he'll become in charge of certain part of the Palestinians when he takes charge of, of Gaza. But we all know for sure for certain, without any doubt, that there are factions within the Palestinian camp, as are within the Israeli camp, uh, who are not very particularly happy about the situation. And they don't make it a secret. They don't blabber. They act. Now, it will be Arafat's business, right now it's our business, to get hold of these people, to kill them, to get rid of them, to put them in jail, and so on and so forth. Let's not take and, and, and brand every Palestinian, or for that matter, every Israeli, by the deeds or rather the misdeeds of some group, bit marginal and not so marginal. And last, if I may conclude one final point. I mean, I wouldn't pin any medal of honor on, on the, on the uh, settlers as was done here. I have lots of, 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 of uh, difficulties with uh, some of the points that were made here historically, which are just incorrect, but we, this is not a, a history lesson. My main thing is the following. You ask what kind of advice and counsel should Rabin seek from us, from anyone. One of the main points, and it brings me back home to one of, the, one of the initial points that I made, is to have law and order enforced by the uh, uh, lawful government of the State of Israel. If the government of the State of Israel, which you may or may not have voted for, but is immaterial, it enjoys the, 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 it enjoys the majority within the parliament, if it had em embarked upon a certain political cause, it should be able to do it, to carry it out, and those who dislike it may stand up in the parliament and say so. But if there are people, if they, as highly as they may think of themselves, and I don't share this, this evaluation, think that they are above the law, they should, it should be made crystal clear to them that nobody, but nobody, be he believer in God, in destiny, in Karl Marx, or in anything, is, be, is, be, is be above the law. Uh, law is, should be enforced on each and everyone, including settlers, and this is exactly what has not been properly done. Would anybody and argue this that? Is, yes, definitely. I think you, I think you, you, you may yes. hear it. I, I really you know, would, would like to yeah, put a point here. You've done exactly what you said we should not do with the Palestinians. You've taken all of the Jewish settlers and you said they've done things which are not okay, they have done this, they have done that. And how and what you, you, excuse me, yeah, sure. I was silent when you spoke, please Sorry. let me Go speak ahead. in peace. This is crossfire, this is terrific. Go ahead. Uh -uh. You said we should not condemn all Palestinians. Mm. Nobody condemned all Palestinians. I sincerely believe that a large number, maybe the majority of Palestinians, are interested in peace. However, you should also not condemn the Jewish settlers and consider them as an entity which is acting against the law, which you just did, and I think that that is improper to do. I think that is not a proper way to approach things. And I think you've been taken captive by certain slogans which were um, uh, said All by right, some All right, but he parties. makes a point. Robin yes. was voted in. The majority of the people voted that government in, no matter how a coalition was formed. He has 61, no matter how you turn, even if it's Arabs who, who make up his coalition. What do you do as a citizen if you're against it? I mean, you can form political processes. I have to explain one major difference, because you brought up between the Camp David agreement, right. which you asked me before whether I supported, and I answered you with an affirmative, right. and the process which is going on now, which I'm very worried about. Let's put it that way. I will not say I'm entirely against, because I think that peace merits great risks. But I think there's a major difference between what happened at Camp David and what happened here. With Camp David, Sadat, without any doubt, made a very brave move and proved by coming over to Israel that he really meant peace and he was going to carry his nation forward in this peace process. We have not, by any measure, seen a similar commitment by the Palestinian nation. And I would like to see a much more serious commitment of the Palestinian nation, not just to negotiations now which may give them a more advantageous point, but a real commitment to a lasting peace with the State of Israel. Okay, we got one minute. You get 30 seconds to uh, finalize your discussion. You get 30 seconds, then we close it out. We'll take a vote later. No, no. Each and every partner to this process, be he a Palestinian or a settler, should be viewed and should be approached and should be handled according to their own activities without any coloring, without any discoloring, without any uh, special approach. Right. And the same should apply 
by, by, by the same Two government. years from now, will there be peace with the Palestinians, yes or no? No, it's, it's, an old, it's a very long process. It's from impossible. All right. A long process. I mean, let's wrap it up. 30 seconds. Okay. I tend to agree that every person has to be judged on his merits, whether it's a Jewish person or a Palestinian person. They have to be judged on their merits without generalizations. All right. Two years from now, will you have Palestinian students in your school? I kind of doubt it. All right. We got to close. We'll see you next week with another show. This was a hot one. Let us hear your comments. Write to us. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.